I'm Jared Boss with uh, Venmo Jim now for working on nine years, uh, landscape architect. Um, I think uh, foremost, I, just, uh, I love design. I found out about uh, design in, uh, in junior high. I started taking drafting classes. I started getting architecture magazines. I think when I was 15 or 16, my mother had placed on my bed Reader's Digest and had this article about emerging professions. It was written on landscape architecture. So that has been the, uh, the focus since. Uh, and uh, I love all things about design. I'm married to an interior designer. Uh, I love art. And if you've met Jim, you'll know that, uh, that he loves landscape architecture and design. It is uh, in everything that he does and thinks about and talks about. It's, uh, I think it's beyond uh, just a job and a career. It's kind of uh, become our lives. So I'm uh, glad to be a part of that. I'm talking today a little bit about uh, Project 180 and the streetscape. Uh, for my career, streets and streetscape and urban design has uh, been a huge part of this. Um, in fact, my first memories are of streetscape. I was uh, born in San Francisco, and I remember walking down the street with uh, my grandmother to the little corner market. And I can remember landing, I don't know if it was a crib or a bed, but I remember hearing the fire engines. So uh, a tie to the street. As a young professional, I uh, attended a lecture. I heard Alan Jacobs talk about great streets and became very interested in that. And then uh, from Alan, uh, obviously, he talked about Jane Jacobs and the work and the, the things that uh, she was talking about as a street advocate and an advocate for the city. And then uh, with this lecture uh, series, I watched Jason Roberts' uh, presentation. What a great guy. I mean, he's kind of a grassroots guy and uh, gets you very excited. So I guess with, uh, with that set up, I'll uh, talk a little bit about Project 180 and uh, go from there. I think Oklahoma City is an amazing city. Um, Blair said that uh, I had the opportunity to work in uh, Las Vegas been fortunate to work on some large jobs, and I, we, we always kind of joke in the office, uh, it's my new favorite city, and so we would, uh, when we started working here, we said Oklahoma City was our new favorite city. But uh, it has become so much more than that. We've made many friends, uh, we've brought our families here, and we really uh, love everything here. And I think as it relates to streetscapes and big ideas, Oklahoma City has a great history for that. Uh, with the land run, people ran, literally ran here and started uh, making a city almost overnight. The uh, OK uh, Cash Grocery and that first streetscape that started in the city happened very, very quickly. And then uh, some very adventurous entrepreneurial types, uh, Henry Overholzer, if I pronounce that correctly, he had these pre-made storefronts that came in via the rail and they made this first street wall uh, in the city. So uh, the speed with which this happened uh, came very quickly uh, several years ago with the, uh, with the vision of the city and some of the things that were happening with their planning group, putting together a new streetscapes initiative, a new streetscapes plan, some of the developments with, uh, with Devin and the city funds and the TIF that came with that. It uh, presented a new opportunity to remake Oklahoma City uh, almost overnight. And uh, we've been very fortunate with that. We started very quickly. We formed a steering committee uh, that included, and I know I'll leave a bunch of people out, but it was the city manager's office, public works, planning, uh, traffic, top uh, uh, stakeholders from within the community. And then as we were talking in the car, Steve uh, Blackmire was there blogging in the back and taking pictures and you know saying, hey Jared, can you hold this light up? And it was just going right on to his blog. Jim, can you hold these papers and can we snap the picture? Um, from the steering committee, we built a, a, a large consultant team that included uh, many great professionals that uh, have become our friends and collaborators from here in the city. This is one of our meetings. I think we had 140 people in the room that day. So when we talk about redoing 180 acres of downtown almost overnight, it's not something that one person can do alone. It 
takes a great team to do that. Uh, we sat down with everybody, we talked about uh, what was important. We wanted to set five goals that we could establish and work towards uh, as a team. One was to create a cohesive central business history. The, uh, the city edge had been leading over the years. Uh, we wanted a street stage that was unique to Oklahoma City as a local context. Um, we wanted to create a new urban fabric that could accommodate this visionary thoughts with the MAPS program, the streetcar, uh, new development that uh, these ideas would spur. So it had to be flexible. Uh, we wanted to create an accessible environment. There had been some issues with accessibility as it related to ramps and, uh, and other issues around the city. And then we wanted to look at a system that was sustainable and smart, uh, using the best technologies, but something that was proven. We set a bunch of metrics. We looked at how many parking stalls are there. We thought there were maybe six to 800. The new plan uh, proposed 1,600. If we want people down here, they've got to be able to park. It has to be convenient. We counted trees. I think we had you know, eight or 900 trees for the whole city. We wanted to plant 2,500. So we set all these metrics based on those goals. We wanted a continuous canopy. We wanted a thread to stitch all these pieces of the city back together. Then we dove right in. I think it was, I think our first meeting, we kicked off, uh, we hired the, the uh, surveyors. We said, can you, how fast can you survey the whole city? They said, uh, give us a scope. We said, the whole city. We said, really? And they said, yeah, can, can we start? They said, so they said, we'll put three crews on seven days a week. In six weeks, we'd survey the whole city. Very few cities even can do uh, things like that. And uh, I think the second meeting we started with planning. So we really looked down at the existing traffic uh, systems, the traffic circulation, and just like typical site analysis, we took hundreds of pictures, we pasted off the streets, we looked at lane widths, we took pictures of all the different light poles, all the, the different street furniture, and started saying, what are, what are all the components? What are all the existing conditions? We also started looking at the traffic reports that looked at 15-year projections and 30-year uh, projections. And uh, from all that information that we started synthesizing together, started uh, looking at best practices and methodology. Uh, the team that we had was great. Uh, with a change this large, there was a little skepticism from time to time in the room. So people saying, if we're going to do this, how can we proof it up? We called San Francisco. They have an amazing Better Streets manual. It's a series of like 10 books that they've been working on. We called New York. We called Dallas. Uh, we talked to a bunch of different cities looking at their best practices and kept saying, you're doing what? You're just putting a pipe in? No, it's face of building to face of building for the whole downtown. And they just were amazed that how much we were going to do. And so we started working through all of these things, right-sizing these lanes, looking at traffic calming. Uh, there was some walkability study that was happening. Um, and just a bunch of things all kind of happening at the same time. And this would be in the afternoons, and Jim would be meeting uh, on the park in the mornings. So with all of that information, we kind of synthesized that. We started working through some of these scenarios. We started right-sizing things. We started talking about getting rid of 30-foot turning radiuses on tight streets and giving them back to the pedestrian and kind of tightening that car path and saying uh, the cars will be figured out, they can slow down, and uh, people will feel more comfortable walking. And uh, started to propose this plan. And the traffic engineers here in town were on board. They said, we'd like to maybe talk with some other people. So we brought in a, a, another consultant from outside that said, you guys are doing all the right things and validating that. So as a team and as a steering committee, it uh, gave us a lot of confidence to uh, move forward. With that, we started looking at some of these ideas. How do we start putting all of these layers together and uh, bringing all these systems uh, into uh, reality? So we continued that, uh, that process. We started looking at that parking. Let's put, we've got to get parking in as many places as we can. We've got to organize it. It's all got to feel the same. It's got to be convenient. It's got to be easy. Around the patient's uh, Latin circle, where you see it in the red up here, uh, we preserved kind of a historic 45. 
and then everything else became on street uh, parking, uh, parallel parking, and then the red dots start to represent this sweeping uh, thought process of adding accessible parking stalls all around the city that, uh, that we couldn't find anybody else in the country who was doing it this magnitude and bringing this level of convenience to, uh, to the city. Um, and then start modeling uh, what, uh, what will this be like? How do we do it? How do we pull these people off to the side of the road and make this system of parallel parking work with some of these requirements? Uh, we work with the ADA, we have a lot of calls. Uh, there's a committee that meets uh, twice a month here in Oklahoma City that, uh, that works through these things and we set up all these standards. We started talking about a bike plan. Randy Enns with planning we had this uh, bike plan that had been completed in, I believe it was 2006. And with most of these plans, there's all this good thought that goes into them. And then they go on a shelf and become this, wouldn't it be nice? And so we started looking at uh, bike parking around the city. In these locations, we started looking at uh, shared lanes and dedicated bike lanes. How do these pieces start to fit in uh, now that we have that traffic plan and the car path? where the bikes start to fit in here. They get their own lane or we tell people we have to share. And then what's that gonna look like? And how's that gonna strike? So we have kind of a colored concrete lane for the dedicated. And then we have the share of symbol that says cars and automobiles, you've got to share the space and work together. Walkability was a huge issue. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that impressed Jim and I, I think on our first visit here was just how tight and condensed everything you kind of read the best of planning manuals, they say about 180 to 200 acres is perfect for walkability. And that was our project. And it was connected to Rip Town that they executed a great vision. And there were these passage points. And so how do we connect those things? How do we uh, take the vision of the core to shore that uh, had a lot of uh, excitement with that and take people from the memorial through the city? How do we engage the park? And then you know, how can people, what are the one minute intervals for walking and how fast can people walk and how far will they walk? And then we just continue the vision with this. Uh, our scope is here. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we love to do in our studio is get the scopes here and we want to look here. So we said, hey, while we're looking at your streets, what if we take these streets out? This is a uh, couch and uh, call for couch, patients laddie. We said, and replaying some of this, and you're really in the city's meeting over here, 420 West Main, the executives are meeting here, your city, uh, city hall, there's the civic center. What if we figure out this campus? And they're like, oh, hold on, keep showing us all these things. And we just kept saying, it's a vision, it's a vision, it's a, it's a renaissance here. Uh, very exciting, everybody just continued to have smiles on their faces, and Jim said, I'm sorry we won't do that. Next time. So we came back next time and said, when we redo the roads, there's this historic piece here that would leave this little park that could be here. So a historic site for the White Temple that's along E.K. Gaylord and Broadway. And um, it's just these kind of grassroots thoughts. You plant these ideas, people see these images, and they think, we've got to do something here someday. Then we looked at the concept development. We wanted people to sit downtown. We didn't want downtown to just be for the smokers. We wanted it to be for business people. We wanted people to eat lunch outside. We wanted people to feel protected from an automobile and feel like you could walk to your girlfriend or your friends and, uh, and just be comfortable. We needed to add some order and get rid of the 50 lights and 20 garbage cans and all of those pieces. And then we started to look at what that street section wants to be. So, you know, in that biggest streetscape scenario, what does this uh, median want to be? We can probably let buses drive in an 11-foot lane, and all the cars can probably drive in a 10-foot lane. They'll drive a lot slower, and people will be safer. We can fit a bike lane in, and we read all about bikes and talked about the programs, and they said a four to five-foot lane is right. We said, well, people drive big trucks here, we'll do a five-foot lane, but we'll give them a tighter lane of parking, so eight feet, and everybody said, we have big trucks, and we said, promise you it'll work and you can see today they're parking their big trucks and the bikes get by and the cars can still and then this transition zone that safety zone that helps you feel comfortable people don't want to walk next to the curb and have cars
cars going by, so you need that buffer, that protection. And then this pedestrian realm that gets into a whole other aspect of city planning and ideas and opportunities. So we looked at all these urban layers and started to fit them together. How do they feel? How do they work? What are the roads that we're going to have? We'll have two lanes, and we'll make where we only have two lanes, we'll make them share so the bikes are comfortable. Um, how do all these pieces fit together? What are our crosswalks going to look like? These can help identify the district with the intersections. They become very visible and very uh, comfortable now. We'll start to put the accessible parking in here. We'll start to get some rhythm with all these street trees. We'll put them tight. They say, two feet? That seems really tight. They say, continuous canopy, trust us. Uh, we'll work through it. And then what are these sections like? How do they feel? How do the banners start to fit in here on streets that we have? What are some of the other layers that we need to do on some of these street trees where we plant them? Uh, we can put out that's in those. And then what's it feel like? What's our what's our real street going to be like? This is uh, Northwest Fifth, uh, just on the east side of the memorial. This is that street that can lead to the memorial. This is the must one of those must see locations in the city. We wanted every uh, street to feel like this. We wanted all pedestrians to be comfortable downtown. We looked at two lanes for the bike lane. So everything's the same. We just added 10 feet for the bike lane. What are the best practices for the bike lanes? They said, how are the cars? What if the bike wants to turn left and there's a car? So we worked through the bike box and we talked about that. So the bike boxes are now green. The bike lanes are charcoal. And all these pieces are starting to fit together as a system. This is uh, East Main Street. The subway's over here. Uh, the IRS building's coming down over here. And then the old Devon building's here. And there's a sky bridge. And we said, we've got to plant all these buildings that have gone bare over the years. We looked at the next stop. Well, what if we need left hand turn lanes? How can we do this in the same right of way? We said, well, we'll, get, we'll end the parking a little bit short and we'll tuck this bike lane over here and everything can work out and everyone will parking hold back and then we have this turn lane that adds flexibility into now a two-way system that was a one-way system. And a one-way system is great in a big, big city, but in a walkable city, two ways the right way to do it. And then we went to four lanes with the turn lane and looked at how all these pieces fit together. But it's all still the same family. It's all that fabric. It's stitching everything together. EK Gable. This passage from the new central business district, this new energy, this renaissance to rip down the entertainment, the fun, the activity, and uh, pulling the two together. And we built models of it all. What's it going to feel like? Let's uh, see if we build the model. Uh, take a peek at it and see what it feels like, it looks like. We put some plans together. We looked at uh, shade and shadow, just all the patterns. What would it feel like to have all these features? And then we got into the amenities. They said, well, your landscape architects, we said, right, we want to look at the traffic signals. We want to look at the lights. Uh, what's appropriate? Uh, is it metal A light? Is it LED? We went through a good process with that. We looked at all the details. We talked to the experts. And we finally arrived with the LED street lights. We told the city if we make the signalization horizontal, we'll start to minimize all of that visual clutter and impact. Let's let people start to see the architecture. Let's let the retail breathe. Let's let the streets just be the fabric. And then, how do all these pieces start to fit together? And then we start looking at some of these renderings. And this is what it will really feel like once we start to execute it. These are the intersections. We, we take away from this and we give back to this. People can start to be able to eat out on the street. The, re, the retail can start to side of the building and always proofing with the technology and is it going to work and we don't want to be the guinea pig and then what are all the urban elements how do they fit together as a family the benches the bike racks the trash receptacles have we thought about recycling no we haven't well we have an office of sustainability here in the city let's ride a grant they wrote a grant they got the money so now we'll have some recycling and we'll start on a pilot program. We'll 
people thought free money, custom tree rates. What are they going to look like? What are they going to look like uh, in, in place? So lots of Photoshop, lots of discussions. And then unifying all of these urban pieces that uh, come together, the grates, the manhole covers. Hey, have you thought about meters? No, we haven't really thought about the meters. OK, well, let's talk to some meter people. Now we're in the process right now of finalizing that contract for the solar meters that will be downtown. We said, hey, since you have uh, recycling cans, have you thought about charging stations? And what if those are free parking stalls downtown? No, but we can write another grant. They did. We're going to put them in. Free money. And then, what are some of those things that make it unique to Oklahoma City? We work with Kathy Wrights, who used to be with the city as a historian. We work with Dr. Ronald Blackburn, who's the state historian. And we thought, let's put some of these elements throughout the city, we'll dot around the city, and let's pull out these points in history and pop culture and things that are relevant. And then these will just be these little exciting points around the city. So, we want to know where the first mayor was shot. We want to know where the first brothel was in town. But we also want to know where the first skyscraper was in town. We want to know what happened at the Civic Center. So Dr. Blackburn was wonderful. He told a bunch of great stories. He talked about color television to streetscapes to brawls and gunfights and dead people in the streets and Tom maybe tunnels that were rumored. So <clears throat> these are just coming online right now. We've just finalized, each will have a unique message that starts to talk about what could happen there. The first one will actually have to call for and talk about that history of the first skyscraper here in Oklahoma City, which will now be next to kind of that Keystone skyscraper uh, next door. We looked at materials, paving samples, um, accessibility, uh, the warning, the detectable warning plates, color concrete for the bike lanes. Uh, color concrete for the intersections. What's it going to feel like? How does that system come together? What well, will happen? And everybody said, oh, Walker doesn't go this way. Walker only comes this way. And we said, well, we'll make it both ways. And all of these things can fit together. And as it's coming together, this is finishing in construction. I saw a chef with a real estate guy and some other, it looked like a money guy the other day, walking through this building. And they were laughing and talking and shaking hands. So the excitement is, I think it's happening. Uh, the vegetation, we, we love plants. Landscape architects, and one of Jim's uh, models is uh, the planting can be excellent. It can be the greatest, it can be the greatest uh, planting that people uh, have seen. So we talked about all of these trees to a continuous canopy and how does all this fit together. This is where we really get into the details of, of this section mediums and then where all of this urban spaghetti is with utilities and gas and footings comes together. We talked about systems that would allow trees to grow in this and have a continuous soil trench and fit that together and what those soil volumes could be. So with a crate system, we can get all of this soil working in here. What are some of the alternatives that we have? if we use structural soil. So seeing how all these urban layers start to tie together. What are the right trees? What's our strategy for each of these streets? And then this planting excellence that can gain these medians and these islands. When will they bloom? How will they grow? How do we maintain them? And then the project update. Currently, we have five streetscape packages that are out. Three are in the process of being finalized, inked, back to the city, complete. Uh, bid package full, uh, four, Sheridan, uh, Walker, uh, and Rob, or Hudson, Sheridan, and Robinson is underway. Most of that should be complete in time for the Arts Festival. Uh, bid package five that's around the, kind of the city campus will be completed later on this year. And then bid package six will stitch all of the previous packages together. And then the future work. How do we continue to build this momentum and make all these things happen? It all started with the ideas and with the team. So it was this design process. It was sitting over the models. I was talking with uh, Dennis Flowers here, the design team. 
and then our locals, Gary Nolan with SRB, uh, who's excited and passionate about changing his city, is working with uh, Lynn, the, one of the city inspectors, so he understands how all these things fit together and the papers lined up and the parking lines up and the lights are on center points and all of these things. And then working with the construction guys themselves doing some of these mock-ups. So everybody gets it, everybody has buy-in, everybody's together. So Big Package 1, Reno and uh, Robinson along Myriad, which is complete, uh, a huge transformation. All of this is <coughs> inside of the new convention center. It's so exciting to have the thunder and see the excitement that's there, drawing people, and people uh, engaging in and walking on these streets. This is that planting excellence I think that Jim talks about a botanical experience in a streetscape medium. And they just flip those grasses and make winter and then come back. And it can be amazing. It's a simple kit of parts uh, that they can work through. <coughs> and then along Reno, and then changing this at that west section of Reno that's felt so blighted, but that street wall of the street trees, the parking. Just adds that context to a challenge area. Big package two. Uh, before at the memorial, everybody said, We can't touch this. This is sacred ground. We have a 15 year memorial coming up. They were wonderful. They want they invited us in. They said, We want to we want to preserve uh, that, that sad memory, that sad time in life, but we want to look forward uh, and be part of all of these improvements. So thoughtfully uh, working with them and putting that together. Uh, have seen that before and after in these intersections and all of this parking now that uh, can work together with that and take us to that, that next level of that, of that living city. So keeping the past and respecting that and adding this new layer to uh, those memories that touch uh, each of us here in, in uh, one way or another and adding that bike lane that's coming on this heart and this whole shore making it comfortable for everybody to walk and know where they're going, have a garbage can, a place to sit, and everything. This streetscape kind of goes into the background a little bit and the architecture and it starts to kind of play. And then the energy of the streetscape on, on West Main, the big condo tower, the Regency, they talked to the contractor when he was out there working on the street scene. They said, hey, we need to get a bid from you. We've got to redo our front door. We're thinking about repainting our building now. So uh, you could say it's part, it's part of streetscape. You could say it was just part of the plans. Who cares? It's just great for Oklahoma City. Bid package three, which is uh, Walker Avenue, uh, West Main, and then uh, a little piece of carving pulling all of this out, putting it back in, having that consistent feeling, that planting excellence that everybody can be a part of and have access to. Looking down West Main Street, city building, the city building, redoing all of this, and every one of these parking spaces is just full. And then the old grace cleaners, is it part of streetscape, or were they really thinking about investing that money and putting it back into the building, releasing, you know, leasing that space and putting in the first line bar in the town and having a patio that faces out onto the streetscape? That, to me, that's a win for everybody. Who, who cares where the credit goes? And then the old Baptist mission that says everybody's figuring it out together, how do we make all this happen? This is that continuous trench for the street trees. These are all these systems coming together. These new sidewalks will then become these new sidewalks. This is yesterday. And then this two-way in and out walk with that great connection that starts to come together. And then the side of the new urban school that will be downtown. Another win for the city. Uh, Sheridan and uh, Robinson. It's a war zone right now. It's inconvenient. I think people can feel the energy though as these things start to come together. It's very exciting. And this is that spaghetti. These are the crates that we stack on top of each other. The utilities can fit through all the 
and then we put this premium topsoil that runs the length of this trench and it works around the light fixtures and then we put a little bit of a gravel cap on that and then the pavers can go in and the trees just above all the soil. So this is all going in and now it's connecting me to the Virginia Lord. Thank you for inviting me and Chair to be here today. We're really excited about that being a part of uh, this lecture series. I'm going to jump to something that uh, kind of relates to what Jared was just talking about, which is Project 180, which uh, also has the, uh, there we go. So this is Mary Gardens. It's a 15-acre botanical garden downtown Oklahoma City. And uh, when we began the project, we were uh, commissioned to redesign the gardens. And I, I think, just like Jared was talking about with the streetscape, there was a lot of uh, curiosity. Well, you're going to add more botanical areas or you're going to uh, make uh, you know a place to do trials and things of that nature for plants and you know we really kind of see this as a hybrid park it's a garden and a park because it's it's in an urban setting which is rare for botanical gardens it uh, there's no fences uh, if you want to go here you can go in the conservatory but it's uh, you know it's a few dollars to go in the conservatory in the Crystal Bridge but but really, uh, to envision taking 15 acres downtown and turning it into a botanical garden, a really first-class botanical garden, would, would be maybe uh, not the right thing to do, because we really wanted to have uh, a park that people could come here and work in the office buildings at lunchtime. People who want to come here before and after a Thunder game, they can do that. People who want families and children want to come here weekends they can enjoy this there would be a children's garden people who want to move downtown and want to have a dog can have a park for their dog so there was a whole list of program elements that i think in the beginning probably surprised the committee but they got on board very quickly and i, I will say I, I want to say a lot of things but i know time is short but um, the people in oklahoma especially you know the folks we work with in oklahoma city were very welcoming and open to ideas uh, that we, if we could kind of prove through a, through a case study that yes, this is happening in other places, it makes some sense. They were they were on board with it, and I, I don't get that kind of reception everywhere we go. So it's nice to come somewhere where people share thinking big. And I talked to Kurt earlier about the, the maps project, and maybe that kind of set the tempo because you know we started with the maps and it totally transformed that town, and then. You know, and then the TIF comes along and everybody's like, yeah, let's go for it. You know, which $30 million, sure, let's do it. You know, I mean, you know, I think if, if you would have gone somewhere else and people were maybe more uh, dialed into, uh, well, we've got to have a, you know, we can only have two trees. We've got to have a bake sale for everything this that we do. We've got to do this. And you know, I think small minded, then you're going to get crushed. But I think uh, in Oklahoma City, everybody was kind of like, yeah, let's do it. So I, I think, uh, you know, there's always a little bit of reasoning that, you know, in the debate, and uh, some, sometimes you have to kind of give in on a few issues. But uh, I think overall, we had a great, we had a, a wonderful committee, and people really wanted to do something spectacular. They realized that it couldn't be the temporary, so. That's a short story. There were there were a lot of impediments to making it. Uh, there were walls around the edges, you know, big burns. Uh, the lake did all kinds of things and it took away a lot of useful area. So the, the areas where you actually can have an event or a wedding or a big party or you know five thousand people for a concert were very limited. I mean, it really wasn't for fifteen acres. The usability of this park was you know five percent, ten percent because it was so chopped up. Um, you know, and I think there definitely are some postcard pictures that people still, you know, look at and go, oh, you know, we had all those big trees and it was so great. But I tell you, not too many people, and we interviewed a lot of people, would go down to the lake edge. Uh, you know, not too many people uh, really uh, felt comfortable in this park after dark. Uh, so there was a lot of challenges with Mary Parks. Uh, and so every square foot of these gardens were renovated. So, you know, it's kind of 
funny that we, we started out saying, well, we'll do a little bit of surgery here, a little bit of surgery here, and then we realized you can't do that, you can't do this, we've got to have ADA ramps here, we've got to do this, we've got to make it more visible for the corners, we've got to do all these things. So we ended up, uh, it's a total redo. I mean, there's probably a few square feet of the water stakes that didn't get demoed, but just about everything else did. Um, this is the plan that we showed, and uh, talked to them about uh, children's garden, the botanical garden, the dog park, uh, a restaurant, which was kind of a new thing to put a restaurant in a, in a venue like this, um, a great lawn, a uh, performance pavilion, a series of interesting water features, uh, renovating some of the uh, some of the plant areas that were focused on botanical interest. And uh, you know, we had, uh, we had a point in time where we either had to go for it and open last year at 11 the <coughs> Arts Festival or pull it back. And uh, I commend the team once again for saying, let's do it. The city is going to be under construction for five years. Let's give something back really quick in a year and a half. And that's what we did. So every, the drawings were finished you know, three months early. And the uh, construction started the day after the arts festival, things, things really progressed quite quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm i happy with uh, the results. I love it when people, you know, will send me photos of, uh, like, first the uh, New Year's Eve um, celebration, and, you know, we're starting to hear that the furniture, all the furniture's out, and, you know, people are using the, the gardens in a different way. Okay. I've had a couple reports this week of people uh, seeing 30 to 50 school kids in the children's garden at this gardens. And that we, we used to get 30 to 50 people a week, you know, mm -hmm. during the nice times of the year. So, you know, the, the, you know, the change has been pretty dramatic. Uh, the lake has uh, shortened quite a bit. Uh, we created a seasonal plaza here, which was, uh, it's, a very thin membrane of water. It turns into an ice rink in the winter. Uh, it is uh, going to be a place where you can grab a drink or bring your lunch out here and sit and uh, just enjoy being in the park. Uh, children are invited to walk through the fountain. It is, uh, has an interesting feature at the end. It's lit with these light bucks at night. Um, You know, we created a lot of places for people to sit, but maybe one of the one big, big moves in the, in the seating strategy was to give people a lot of movable furniture so they could create their own environments. Um, one of the uh, interesting things we uh, worked on, a uh, very good fountain designer, fluid in uh, Los Angeles, is this children's interactive feature, and it's uh, a water feature, and uh, it goes through a whole sequence. It starts to rain, mist, then it gets heavier, the cloud, the sound of the clouds comes through, and then the rain comes down very far, and then the rain finally stops. The fog comes on, it's like the fog after rain. And then these flowers, the, the uh, Indian blanket flower comes out of the deck, and it creates these uh, beautiful fan jets that, that the kids like to jump from one to the other. And it's, uh, it's, Pretty cool. I, you know, we we had uh, some uh, involvement, but uh, a lot of the credit, most of the credit, goes to Fluidity and Jim Garland. They did a wonderful job on this feature. I think it's going to be something that uh, you know the kids will really have to go and see. It will be one of those uh, interesting developments uh, as part of the gardens. You know, I think the programming is another big thing. You know, it, it's a we've given the keys to the city. Uh, there's still a bit of remedial work on the planting, which, you know, really, as Derek says, planting design is a big thing for me. It bugs me that we haven't gotten all the plants finished and shored up and watered and done all that. That just didn't happen last year for a number of reasons, but it's happening right now. But uh, I think programming, and Maureen Hefferman is the new director of Mary Gardens. She's amazing. And I think at the farmer's markets and having the the uh, children's events and children's art and having fun runs and having uh, a lot of activity, I mean weekly, daily activity in this garden is really going to make it uh, successful. 
And a couple of people in the committee, you know, the garden was going towards the children's area, was going towards it being very educational. You know, we're going to have um, everything about, uh, you know, the plant process and uh, uh, sustainability and all these great things. But um, then one person said, you know, wouldn't it be good if, in that children's garden? I know it's a children's garden, a botanical uh, garden. Wouldn't it be great if we had a place where children could also play and use their muscles and run and exercise and, you know, kind of have fun with their buddies? So um, we tried to make it that also kind of a hybrid where there's a focus on plants, but there's also a focus on activity for the kids, like high energy kind of activity. The dog park, uh, first dog park downtown, uh, that's the first dog park. Was there another dog park? Okay. Yeah, and uh, we uh, got a lot of pushback. This may be the most controversial thing, which is kind of funny. And he said, well, why don't we have it, you know, make a dog park. And I've seen projects we've designed in other big cities where the dog park was the difference between a developer building and a $100 million condominium project. So, you know, a little dog park is cost not very much in the big picture. It does make a difference to someone who wants to live downtown to have a dog and uh, wants to have a place where they can go and enjoy uh, taking their dog. Uh, again, this series of interesting water features and band show architecturally. There's some beautiful elements that uh, make up the park. That was designed by Gensler, David Epstein, who designed the band show. This is the wave pool. The wave you know, ripples over this edge and cycles. Kids love it. Really kind of cool thing. And this is what I'm most proud of, is that we have a place now where uh, it's not all concrete benches lined up in rows. It's uh, not, uh, and that's not the way it was, but I think, I think that uh, people, uh, uh, you know, now can kind of create their own environment. They can, you know, they can relax with family and friends and they can enjoy going to see concerts at, uh, at the gardens. The botanical interest will come on, come back this year if you were there last year. Yeah, they were curious where the plants are. They will be there this year. And at night, it's pretty spectacular, too. The uh, Crystal Bridge has the LED lights and it changes colors. Um, and uh, there's concerts, which is really cool. Um, people are coming downtown to uh, see performances in area gardens. And uh, we had a report that there were 50,000 people. Uh, I don't know if that's totally accurate, but that's pretty, pretty cool to get that on the years. 50,000 people okay. in the morning.
Where does the water come from and where does it go? Landscape architecture that's working on bioswales and an alternative way of managing stormwater. And obviously, Oklahoma's in the midst of dealing with water issues. And, and I've been to, let's see, Sacramento, and Sacramento's one of those shade line downtowns with trees, you know, on both sides of the streets, everywhere you go. It's gorgeous, it's wonderful, that's going to be exciting. What about maintenance of these trees, the, more, the water that's required to take care of them? And did you consider the, all these landscape areas that you've done, um, they're curved up, and I've, I've seen and read about places where, you know, parking lots are cut out where actually all the drainage goes to bioswale landscaping beds. Uh, was that considered, have you done that thing in any cities? Was that considered here at all? Just the question. Can I answer real quick from Mary Gardens, all water Gardens goes down through pipes to those scalloped edges around the lake and it's filtered. So we're using the aquatic plants as a filtering mechanism before the water goes into the lake. So we use the water as a, as a basin for the lake. Uh, eventually, not at this moment, we're still working on some irrigation fixes, but we'd like to use the lake during good rain years. We had a bad rain year last year, no water. Uh, to use the water from the lakes, all the water spills, filters, goes to the lake, and then it's used to put back on the plant. So it's just a cycle. Um, there's still some kinks being worked out on the irrigation system. We're using some domestic water, which really bugs me, but we're going to get that figured out on the streets. Streetscape, everything we did was with drip irrigation, and the mandate from day one was we cannot upsize any of the storm sewers. So the silt cell and the structural soils that we're using in all of those planters, those are areas that can store water and with less pavement, we ended up actually with less water. Right, thanks. Yes. Um, what are some of the things you will get to create year-round use in your new uh, Things to look at for, for year-round use. Uh, yeah, we, um, well, the seasonal plaza actually is set up as a bike rental and small cafe restaurant building, and then that converts to escape rental, hot chocolate, things like that during the uh, winter. That that whole plaza changes from uh, the water spring, a little shoe water, and a place for kids to walk through and play in, and people to sit and have a drink and enjoy that that plaza. And it could be an offshoot of a restaurant once we get the restaurant vendor figured out. But uh, and then in the winter, you know, it's it's all ice ice rink. Uh, I think the mechanical interest in the the bowl, so to speak, east and west around the lake would be very interesting. We we created uh, ramps and walks and steps. And we've got multiple ways to get down to the water's edge. Uh, there's an idea of uh, having rental for radio model boats uh, at the lake down below. 